Hello everyone and welcome back to another video and today we're taking a look at another ePower graphics card. Just that this time I didn't ePower this myself because this is the GTX 470 that I benched at the bench meet in Stuttgart and this card is one of ASICs that he gave to me so I can eventually do some oscilloscope shots of it. And the special thing about this card is that it comes attached with his B3 version of his ePower and that's what we're gonna talk about today. Before we continue, I'd like to thank my sponsor, PCBWay. If you are working on a project of your own that requires parts that would be hard to make yourself, or just generally parts at a much higher quality standard, you can go to PCBWay's website and order anything from PCB prototypes, assemblies, CNC parts, 3D printed parts, as well as stencils or even flexible circuit boards. The ordering process is simple, you just upload your files, tell them some stuff that you need, and you'll quickly receive a quote, which once accepted, will mean that your part can get shipped out within as fast as 24 hours. And if you have any questions or require further help, they even have a live chat service that stands ready for you. So if you need some custom-made project parts, don't delay, go to PCBWay today. So every time I talk about ePowers on this channel, I should give a brief introduction because it is a pretty extreme modification and a lot of people just don't really know what they're looking at when they see this for the first time. So. The general idea of an ePower is to replace the onboard VRM of a graphics card or really anything that needs power. Usually this is done because the onboard VRM is either broken or it's just not powerful enough to handle the heavier overclocking that you want to do. Like basically it's guaranteed to explode or the voltage regulation quality isn't quite good enough. That's when you take an ePower and slap it on a card like this. And when it comes to ePowers, there have basically only ever been two kinds. The first kind is something like this. This is an EVGA ePower 5 and this is a commercially available, or used to be a commercially available ePower. This was very expensive. The MSRP was around 150 euros, I think. But for that you get quite the VRM. This actually has two outputs. It has a 12-phase vCore VRM and a 2-phase memory VRM. And it even has an onboard interface reading the voltage and letting you adjust it with these little knobs. So this is quite feature-packed, quite powerful. I think this can power anything other than a 980 Ti or like a 30 or 40 series card. So uh, yeah, from the time when this was made, which is like the 10 series uh, and older, like this was basically the best thing you could get. Like the only thing that wouldn't work was like a 980 Ti or Titan X because those things just, th those things are just insane uh, when you really push them. But yeah, so this uh, is the expensive kind of e-power, a <laughs> really nice kind of e-power. But not everyone has 150 euros to shell out for an e-power to then put it on a 15 euro card. So for that, there are other options like this. So this is a very cheap e-power. This costs about 15 euros to make because all you need to do for this is buy an old graphics card usually something like a GTX 480 or GTX 580 because those tend to break from dead memory modules or cores, the VRMs on them tend to be fine. And then you cut them in half, you do some modifications and you can use the VRM. This one actually also has two outputs, it has a six phase vCore and a two phase memory. And yeah, really all that's done is you saw that you have your potentiometer for adjusting the voltage of the vCore VRM and you have this little a converter that feeds 3.3 uh, volts into the board because you get your 3.3 volts from the PCIe slot right here and as you can see that's no longer there. So yeah, uh, this is <laughs> the cheap kind of ePower. You can make 10 of these for the price of one ePower 5, but of course these are a bit janky. These don't really have any nice interfaces like you, you change the voltage by this, uh, the VRM is a lot less powerful and of course everything's a bit more janky with you having to like solder on stuff and mod things and you know re rewire things because you cut the card in half. But this is a pretty cheap and effective way of making an e-power. And now ASIC has started his project quite a while ago. We've taken a look at this which is the B2 prototype of his e-power a while ago and the idea behind these was that you also buy uh, one of these cheap older cards. Specifically, this is meant to take the components from an Asus GTX 560, 560 Ti, 570 or 580 from the DirectCU 2 lineup, because these basically share all the same VRM components. And instead of taking that card and cutting it in half and modding the card itself, you get one of these PCBs, 
something like this, you get this unpopulated PCB, and then you take the parts of the card you bought, you transfer them onto this PCB, which is already pre-wired for everything that you need, and then you have a properly made ePower, but for a much, much lower price. Like, this is a bit more expensive than the other self-made ePower, because you have to pay for the PCB extra, but this is still gonna be in like the 20 to 30 euro range, which is still a fraction of an ePower 5. And feature-wise, this is a lot closer to an ePower 5. Although admittedly, yes, it is still not quite there. Uh, the VRM on this is still a six phase. It is just a single output. This does not have a nice uh, button interface like the ePower 5, but it is a very, very good ePower for what you get. We've already taken a close look at the features in the previous video, so I don't want to put too much time into that, but essentially in terms of uh, controlling these. You have these two switches here, um, and these switches can also be replaced by just soldering the contacts together or leaving them open. You don't have to get the switches because these are extra parts that you don't get with that old card you buy. Everything else on this is just taken from the card. Uh, and yeah, the lower one is used for setting the vid. So this is one way of setting your voltage. This is literally just using the interface that usually the graphics card uses to tell the controller what voltage it wants. And this, if you have the switches like this, can be used while the card is running. If you solder that, of course you can't, then it's just one static voltage and you can't change the vid while it's running. Then over here you have some feature enable switches. The left two are just for disabling the overcurrent protection, either globally or per phase. And then the right ones are for enabling the adjustment via potentiometers, like this one that we used for the still present onboard memory VRM on this card, um, of the voltage and switching frequency, which you can attach right here. So you flip these switches, you connect these two pads, and then you can connect a potentiometer either for changing the output voltage or the switching frequency. And also over here you also have a little probe pad so you can check the frequency that you set. Then over here you also have some more interface points. Um, two of these you have to solder to. So, again, because uh, this PCB, the ePower itself doesn't connect to a PCIe Express slot, there is no source of 3.3 volts. So you need to externally feed 3.3 volts into this because there's also no regulator on the card that we can reuse. There is a 5 volt regulator, it's right here, but 3.3 volts still has to be externally powered. You can use a little buck converter like this, or you can steal it from the card that you're e-powering, which we've done in this case. So you can see this red wire, which uh, takes 3.3 volts from here from the e-powered card and feeds it into the e-power, and that's how the e-power gets its 3.3 volts. And then there's also these other two contacts, which belong to the same thing, that you also have to solder. These are not wired up by default, and these are required for the ePower to work. You can choose how to wire them up, but basically it's recommended that you do it like this, because these are for forward voltage sense. And this is a cool feature that this ePower has. The ePower 5 also has it, but you need to go out of your way to use it. Whereas this one is intended to be used like that. Because one problem you have with an ePower is that the voltage controller on the ePower, it doesn't know what it's ePowering, it's just delivering po power to it. There's no way that the graphics card can communicate with the ePower to tell it what it wants. And the problem with that is that there's impedance in all your connections. There's impedance in the ePower, there's impedance in the connection right here, there's impedance in the power plane on the graphics card. And all that impedance leads to a voltage drop depending on how much current you're pulling. And this leads to a phenomenon that's very common with ePowers, is that you set your voltage to say 1.3 volts while you're sitting on the desktop and then you start your benchmark and you're down at 1.1 volts. Which is obviously not enough to run whatever you want, you want 1.3 volts. One solution to that is to just adjust the voltage under load, but then you have the reverse problem of when you're sitting on desktop, you're gonna get a super high voltage, like 1.5 volts, which is not good long term. And then the other solution is to use forward voltage sense like this. Because these two pads right here, one is positive and one is for ground, are used to tell the controller the exact voltage that it's outputting. Usually by e-powers, if you cut them like this, the ePower will sample the voltage that's coming directly out of the VRM. 
but by wiring up forward voltage sense, the controller will use the voltage that's actually getting here to the GPU core as the reference. So it will be outputting whatever here, whatever it needs, so that here you get exactly what you set. So at idle, you get 1.3 volts here and also around 1.3 volts here, but under load, you still get 1.3 volts here, but over here it's gonna put out like 1.45. So the output here will change, but this will stay the same, and this is what you want to stay the same. So this is what the forward voltage sense is supposed to do. And you don't have to use this. Uh, this board actually used to be pre-wired to this capacitor right here, like we changed how it's wired up at the bench meet because um, yeah, you can of course just wire it up to the output of the board itself and then it works the same way as all the other e-powers. But um, if you can have forward voltage sense, you should go for forward voltage sense because it just makes it so much easier to run something because you don't have to worry about your voltage changing depending on how much current you're drawing. So this makes everything just a lot easier to work with and I really like that this is properly implemented here. Uh, because on the ePower 5 over here, you need to like desolder these two resistors and then connect it from there, like, like yeah, it's just, eh. I guess it's not too much more difficult, but like desoldering these two and then connecting everything correctly, it, it's just more tedious than just like, oh, here's your pre-made connection points, just connect them, there you go. So yeah, and then, I guess let's go over some of the changes from the previous version of the ePower. So this is the B2 version, like I've already said, and that's the B3 version. And the first thing you're gonna notice is that the B3 is a lot smaller. In fact, the B2 is more closer in size to an ePower 5. Uh, and now the B3 is similar in size to, and it's a bit larger, but in, t in terms of thickness, very close to like your standard size uh, card. This basically just makes it easier to work with. It gives you more space for other things. And this is something that ASIC just wanted to do. Like the B2 was just get it to work and now the B3 was like make it more practical. Another change that I really like is that you now have Vol um, B core and ground on both sides of the e-power. You can see on the B2 how we just have B core on the front and then just ground on the back. That's the only power strips you get. Whereas on the B3, you get both on both sides. This is good because sometimes you have a graphics card that doesn't have the VRM on the right side like here, sometimes you have them on the left side. And then if you don't have both kinds of power strips on each side, you're forced to, power, um, you're forced to mount the e-power upside down, which means it's gonna be really hard to get cooling to the MOSFETs. And by simply including this, you're not getting rid of that problem because you just don't use the other power strip then, just use the other one. Another change that's been done is that the output filtering has slightly changed. You can see we have less CAN type capacitors, but more SMD polymers. In fact, the old board just didn't have SMD polymers at all. It was all CAN type. And also what you can't see because it's already installed, but you can see it on this blank PCB is that on the back there are further filtering capacitors, more SMD polymers and even some MLCCs. So in terms of output filtering, this board is much better because it now gives you all three types of capacitors and even though the CAN types, you have less of them, it's gonna be overall probably more capacitance as well. Then the only other notable thing is that ASIC said that the layout of the components around the controller has been slightly changed to make soldering them on just a little bit easier. Because the main drawback of this ePower is of course that you need to assemble it yourself. You can't buy these pre-made. I got these two pre-made from ASIC because he went through the work of assembling them himself but everyone who wants to get one, you're just gonna receive like these blank PCBs here, and then you're gonna have to populate them yourself, which is something that not everyone can or wants to do. And that's about it with the new ePower B3. This is still marked as engineering sample, so there might be a B4 version, or perhaps he decides to just keep it this way and now let people ask him to get one of these. As far as I know, the cost for one of these PCBs is about 15 euros, and in order to get one, you just need to message him on like the HWBot Discord and kind of prove to him that you know what you're doing, like show some cards you modded or show some other e-power you built once just so that he knows that you can actually build one of these correctly. Because he doesn't want to send these out to just anyone and then have someone who just doesn't know what they're doing just like break something or get super frustrated. 
And as it comes to the future of this project, he has now started working on a second ePower. One that is a bit more exciting because that ePower will probably be available as a finished product. It will be more expensive, it will probably be around 50 to 70 euros. That is still about half the price of an ePower 5, but it will be available as a finished VRM. So you can order one of these and you'll get it pre-assembled. It's currently in the very early draft stage. Uh, I've seen some very early concepts and it's basically a... And it's built around an eight phase on semiconductor VRM controller that uses three power stages per phase. So basically it's a eight phase VRM but with the components for a 24 phase VRM, which might sound familiar because that's basically an RTX 4090 VRM and that's essentially what he's going for. So it's gonna be in terms of complexity, similar to this one, it's gonna be in concept similar to this one, it's just gonna use more modern hardware that you can still buy new, so you can have it pre-assembled when you order this at places like PCBWay. But the actual VRM that will be on this won't be a six phase like this, it'll be an eight phase with three phases worth of components, like three uh, inductors, three power stages per phase, which would make that actually the strongest e-power ever made. Because currently, that I'm aware of, the strongest e-power ever made is the Hall of Fame e-power, which was a 16 phase with 50 amp or 60 amp power stages. And he's planning, well, 24 of them, <laughs> which is quite a lot more. He's going with just uh, 55 amp, I think, but um, like it's still quite a lot more of them, so it will be able to push more current in the end because it's essentially an RTX 4090 VRM, you know how much power these things pull. So that means that ePower will be able to ePower a 980 Ti, uh, a Titan X, and perhaps even a 30 or 40 series card if you can work around the um, dual power plane design where they have VRMs on both sides of the core. So yeah, it's gonna be exciting. Um, it's probably gonna take quite a while <laughs> before he finishes that. Um, but when he finishes that, of course, if I can, take a look, I will take a look, and uh, yeah, so that's gonna be it with A6 ePower. I really like how this went, like we overclocked this card no problem, we didn't even have a heatsink on the VRM, like it was fine. It was chugging back like a liter of liquid nitrogen per run and was running at like 1.45 volts, the VRM did not care, like <laughs> even though it's just a six phase, this is still a very powerful ePower board. So, yeah, I like I like this thing. Uh, if I can get one of these uh, Asus Direct C2 cards as a donor, I'll maybe assemble one of these myself and then have an additional ePower board. I might install this on something. I kind of want to use this for the next cheap ass chips. You know, whatever comes. So, with that, until next time, goodbye.